How are you doing? Oh, there we go. You good? It's a beautiful day out there. My name's Jabin, and I get to open God's Word with you this morning. Uh, we're going to continue our <coughs> series in 1 John. We're in chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to go to chapter 2, verse 2. Before we begin, let's pray. <sighs> Father, I find the need to pause and submit myself uh, and this morning and my time to you today. Again, um, I pray that as we sit together here and we submit ourselves to your word, to your authority, I pray that you could, <laughs> we could calm our minds and hearts all the, the busyness of life and the chaos that life brings, Father, I pray that we could just set that aside. And as we do that, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. We are in such desperate need for, for your word and for your spirit, uh, for your conviction, for your encouragement, for your work in our lives. We, we are in need. We are a needy people. We confess that to you, our Lord, this morning, and we thank you that you are faithful to, to provide. Where we are in need, you are our provider. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're in 1 John, and John is writing this epistle, and um, he's writing it to an audience that had been subject to some false teaching. And what John believes is that how we understand reality, how we understand the world around us, how we understand who God is and what God is like is really, really important. Do we agree with him? There are some teachers going around that had some really basic things wrong. But as you know, if, if we get some basic things wrong, sometimes, or often, those things are foundational to our faith. So these guys are going around teaching, and they have these basic things wrong, but they're very important things about reality, what the world's like, and what God's like. In our passage today, John seeks to clarify a couple things. He does a lot in our passage, and I'll be the first to say, we're not going to get to every single thing he talks about. But a couple of things he clarifies. He wants to clarify just who this God is and what serving this God looks like. Did you guys all read the whole of 1 John as Terry instructed? Yes, a couple hands. We are so blessed. I, as I came into work today, I just turned on my... If you guys don't have version, the Bible app version. I just turned it on, and I hit the audio, and I listened to it like two or three times this morning. In the background, it was just on. I would encourage you to do the same. Um, <laughs> let's read our passage. 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Jesus and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2. My, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. If John left it at that, if that's all he gave us, all of his pagan contemporaries would nod, raise their head, 
or raise their hand and nod <laughs> in agreement. This initial description that God is light is a little bit vague and innocuous. It's innocent. He was correcting some false teaching, but as a general statement, any theist, anyone who believes that there's any kind of spiritual God or being, could get on the same page as John. If you just left it at God is light. Think of the spiritual but not religious person that you might know in your life. You could go to them and say, do you agree with this statement? God is light. They would look at you and kind of say, uh, sure, I guess so. <laughs> what does that even mean? Later on in the book, John says, God is love. Uh, yeah, I guess I can get behind that. God seems like he should be a good guy, and love is a good thing, right? This is, it's very ethereal, this description. What does ethereal mean? Delicate. It means something almost too good for this world. Or we could use the word transcendent to use this, descri to use this description of God. Transcendent means beyond the range of normal or merely physical human experience. John introduces God here as a, in transcendent and ethereal terms. He, he introduces God in terms that put him beyond the range of normal human experience. This is true of God, obviously. He's the creator. We're the created. But it's not the whole story. Amen? Thankfully, the false teaching John was confronting didn't have the whole story. They didn't have the whole story about who God was, and because of this, they were in error. Yes, God is transcendent, but he is also a God that is involved intimately and personally in his creation. He is imminent. He operates within creation. Now, probably the clearest place that I can see this paradox of God's transcendence, his complete otherness, and his imminence, his hands-on involvement with creation, the clearest display of this paradox is in Genesis. Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2. So if you want, you can, you can turn your Bible there all the way to the left. Um, and I think John would appreciate us going to Genesis. He opens up his gospel that way, right? We all know how it starts. Genesis, in the beginning, God created we capitalize the G in this word God because we know who this God is, right? This is the Christian God. This is our creator. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this, this word for God that Genesis 1 uses is a rather generic term, and it could almost be translated with a, just like a lower, lowercase g and just like a God created. And there's a reason for this. It's because the author of Genesis wanted to describe God in these transcendent terms that John does. He wanted to paint a picture for us of a God that exists outside space and outside time, that is entirely separate from creation, is entirely self-sufficient, and... <laughs> There's, there's, multi, there's, a, there's a bunch of ancient Near Eastern creation narratives that sound a lot like Genesis, but they're very different in certain ways. There's multiple gods, and there's adultery among these gods, and there's m murder. One cuts another god in half, and all this chaos that goes on in creation. Genesis 1 doesn't sound at all like that, does it? There's one god. He's separate from creation. He's totally self-sufficient. And all he does to create is to speak. Now, the false teachers that John was addressing would have been on, page with the, on, on the same page as this God too, right? They could accept this type of transcendent being as their creator. Just like the spiritual but not religious person I was talking about earlier. They could accept a God that's out there but not too terribly personal. These people, people, the, the false teacher that John, the false teachers that John is addressing were called Gnostics. Uh, but they could not, they could accept this transcendent and ethereal and distant and separate God, but they could not accept a God that would condescend into creation, that would sully himself 
by involving himself with the filth and purity of this physical world. That's what they believed. They couldn't stomach a God that was personally involved in creation. So the author of Genesis 1, like John, paints a picture of this transcendent God deliberately. He wanted to portray a creator God that was completely outside space and time and creation, and a God that was totally self-sustained and self-contained and self-sufficient. But that's not the whole story. If we turn to the second page of Genesis, Genesis 2 verse 4, we get a second creation narrative. And the first thing you might notice is the name of God changes, doesn't it? We have this fairly generic term for God in chapter 1. Chapter 2, enter the Lord God. The personal name of the creator is now introduced into the second creation story. Why? Why the change? Well, because we have a different creation story in chapter 2 than we do in chapter 1, and we have a different picture of the same God that's creating, but we, have a different, we get to see a different side of this God. The transcendent and other God of chapter 1 becomes the tangible, the close, the imminent, and the personal God of chapter 2. He doesn't just speak to the plants and they exist. We get this picture of him being in the garden, and we get the sense that he's pushing up the plants with his own hands from the roots, right? And instead of speaking mankind into existence, what happens? He forms man with his own hands out of the dirt of creation. And then he goes further. <laughs> How does man come to life? God breathes his own breath into the nostrils of man. And so now, <laughs> what does this have to do with John's God of the God that is light? We have a transcendent God, but the God of the Bible, the Christian God, the God that the Gnostics refused to believe in, these false teachers that John was addressing, couldn't believe in the second part of a, an intimate, a personal, a personally involved God. John's audience had fellowship with this God. And this fellowship was about communion with and participation in God. And this type of God, the false teachers, just couldn't stomach. So who are these Gnostics, these false teachers? <clears throat> they believed that the created order was not only inferior to the spiritual, but that it was um, inherently impure and sinful. So they thought, a perfect, holy, pure God couldn't create an impure creation, so they devised all these demi demiurges and these, all this, this crazy mythology of these other gods that were false. And so if creation, if this world we live in is impure and evil, there's a couple of ways you can... <laughs> There's a, there's a couple of different ways you can go, and there's a couple of different ways that Gnostics went. They went to asceticism, or they went to hedonism. Asceticism is basically just self-denial, voluntary poverty, severe austerity, and absolutely no enjoyment of pleasurable things of this earth. Okay? That's asceticism. Or other streams of Gnosticism went to hedonism. Walter mentions <laughs> judges. Hedonism is just doing whatever you think is right in your own eyes. If it feels good, do it. That's hedonism. These are the two ways that, because the world, this world, this created world, in their eyes was um, impure, and because it was inferior to the spiritual world, they didn't have to give any mind to this existence. And John wants to straighten this out, because that's not the case. He wants to straighten out the thinking of Christians, so he establishes who God is and what he is like. And this extends to, um, this, extends to this created, physical, and fallen world, because our God is not just transcendent, 
but he's happy to work within creation and within history. He cares about how we work, how we live and walk in this life, in the here and now, on this side of the resurrection. So these extremes of asceticism, you know, extreme self-denial, or the other extreme of hedonism, ex extreme self-pleasing, couldn't be further from the truth that John is preaching. The creator who made the world is good, and the creation itself is good. It's fallen, but God has personally taken it upon himself to set it right. How did he do this? The eternal, the transcendent Logos, <laughs> Jesus, the Son, took on flesh. Not only this, he himself died taking on the weight of sin. This is, this is absolutely astonishing. It's profound. That the transcendent God cared enough about this creation and us that he would enter it. And not just enter it, but take on the consequences of that sin on himself. It's hard to overstate how deeply imminent and intimate and personal the God of the Bible is. He invites us to not only fellowship with him, but to participate in his very being. This is what it means to walk in the light. We should very quickly get away from uh, thinking that this is just a, simply an exhortation to not sin. Is it that? Yes, it is, certainly. It's true, but if that is where we get hung up and stop, we're missing John's main point. God is so perfectly close, imminent, and intimate that he invites us, lowly humans, to participate in his divine being. This was absolutely astonishing to, God's, or to John's audience, and it should be astonishing to us. It should never cease to amaze us that this is the God we serve. So at this point, I want to read our passage again to get us recentered on what John's talking about. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So John lays out what it means to live in fellowship with the Creator God, who breathes his very own breath of life into us. And he lets us know where the moral bar is. It's high. It's really, really high. And not a single one of us ever reaches that bar. The demands of God, the demands themselves are transcendent, aren't they? They're out of reach. But there's good news. The good news is that God is faithful and just to forgive, but it doesn't stop there. The entire point of this passage is that God has made a way for us to continue in the light. Forgiveness of our sins is not the end in themselves. The forgiveness of our sins is a means to the end. The end goal for us human beings, the greatest achievement we could ever reach, is fellowship with our Creator. And that Creator himself makes the way. That's what John is talking about. See, the Christian life is not a static one. We don't just say a prayer to avoid hell and then just like do our best. We don't achieve some status and just wait to become disembodied cloud dwellers 
you know, we get our, get our wings, get our harp, hang out in the clouds, disembodied from this creation. That's actually kind of a Gnostic idea itself, that we have to escape this awful creation. No, we're called to walk in the light, to do the truth, and to participate in our creator. This life we have in Christ is dynamic. Yes, God is transcendent, but he has become so perfectly imminent in the person and work of Jesus. For what reason? So that we can walk daily and continually in the light, in God's very being and in God's presence. First John teaches us about the nature of reality and how we as humans are to best exist in that truth. Uh, John isn't the only biblical writer to see things this way. Let's read a portion of uh, Romans 8. See if you can pick up on some similarities, okay, between what we just read in John and Romans 8 by Paul, the apostle. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. This is the Christian Christian message. Our sins are forgiven so that we might live with our creator. Jesus in John 15, John's Gospel, uh, gives a similar analogy. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's all the same message. The reality of being a human is that if we want to live, we are offered true life. In our Creator. We are offered the participation, the fellowship of our Creator. So, what is the message that John has received from Jesus and is telling us here today inside of the chapel? Well, it's the same message that Jesus gave the disciples about abiding in Him, and it's the same message Paul preached to the Christians in Rome. And there's many more examples, right? I set before you blessings and curses, the two roads, the narrow and the wide. There are two ways to live, and we are not called to only live before a transcendent and holy creator outside of his reach and outside of his influence, but we are called to live in and with a very personal God, a God that is so personal he actually cares about you individually. And if we sin before our God, he will forgive us so that we can continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. If we have greed in our hearts or we slander our brothers and sisters, if we get more worked up about something silly than we maybe should, there is a way back. Maybe in this election season we're tempted to think that the hope and future of Jesus' church is in the hands of our political leaders. It's not. It's Jesus' church. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. I want you to pause and imagine that. We, we can get so fluent in Christianese that we can breeze by a statement like we have an advocate in Jesus Christ who stands before the Father and prays for us. He prays on our behalf. The transcendent, the word of life, Jesus entered into creation, atones for our sins, ascends to the Father, and prays for you. 
We get to walk in that light. Is there anything more profound than that? As I'm reading through this passage and preparing this sermon, I'm just, I love the Bible. Every human on the planet needs this message. And whether or not they know it, they want this message. They're created to accept this message. That the one that created them, he's outside space and time. He doesn't need anything. And where we mess it up, He enters that space and time. He takes on flesh. This idea is crazy. And a lot of people just haven't been able to accept it. Even Gnostic Christians are like, I'm with you, almost, I'm almost with you, but there's no way that a holy God would become man. Can't go there. But he does. And not only that, he dies, pays for the sin, is resurrected, ascends to the Father, and it still doesn't end. He's there today as our advocate. It's our privilege today to walk in that light. That's what he's talking about. That's what John's talking about. Terry's going to come, and he's going to lead us in communion. I would encourage uh, you to take this time in prayerful reflection. Let's not bree breeze over this reality as we're so tempted to do day in and day out. In prayerful reflection, let's ask God if there are areas in our lives that are dark, areas that require repentance. And let's take this time to thank God that he has made a way back to him. Second, how do we ensure that we are walking in the light when all around us is dark? And the third question, Jesus has made a way that our sin does not exclude us from walking in the light. Amen? Thank God. <laughs> what does John say we must do in order to remain in fellowship with God? I would encourage you to do that now. Our benediction Today comes from Romans, uh, Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.